Hey everybody, so welcome to another uh, community call where the first thing that we're going to do today is show off our new uh, editor moderation dashboard, which we just shipped. So uh, Kobe will walk us through that feature. Uh, one second. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Kind of the background context here too is like a, a central place within the app for editors to have more of an overview of the content that's being shared like in their hub and over research hub in general. So if there's like low quality or like kind of like spammy comments, we'll be able to aggregate them and uh, get rid of them quicker while still giving feedback to like the people who like share those comments on why they're being removed. Yeah. <clears throat> so we added this button. Um this flag button next to pretty much every piece of content on the site. So you can see it on a paper page. You can see it on like a comment. And basically when you click on it, um, what used to happen before, it just used to like only allow you to flag for copyright. Now you can flag for a specific reason. So you can say like uh, the reasons we've chosen so far, spam, copyright infringement, low quality, um, not constructive. So things like things, I agree, plus one, plagiarism, rude or abusive. So we will, um, yeah, just for the sake of this demo, what I'm going to do, I'm just gonna like uh, maybe do a test comment. So test, this will be deleted. So creating this comment, and now I'm going to flag my own comment. I'm going to say it's low quality. Um, now it's flagged. And um, basically, I'm going to refresh this page because I want to show you one more thing. So if I refresh this page, you'll see there is a count next to that shield button and um, basically indicating that there is an action that needs to take place. And if you click into the shield button, you'll see that that count is right next to flag content. And here you'll see that uh, it's kind of a weird thing. I flagged my own content, but uh, I flagged this content for low quality. And the, go the goal is really to have um, this flag content dashboard always show zero flag content, meaning that we should take an action on every piece of item that uh, gets its way here. Um, but um, anyway, so here there is two things I can do. I can either remove the content or I can say like, actually this content looks okay, I'm going to dismiss it. So if I remove the content, what's gonna happen is this exact um, like modal is gonna show up and it's gonna default to what the user selected. Uh, but as a moderator, as an editor, I actually have the option of actually overriding what the user selected in case um, you know it was slightly inaccurate because we are removing the content and we want to be as accurate as possible. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, remove this content and boom, it disappears. And if you want to find it, there is uh, this filter here at the top. You can filter by basically flags that were dismissed. Uh, and you can see all the removed content here. And you can see here I removed my content as well as like uh, every other content that's been removed. You can also filter by hub. So in case we get like a lot of content uh, making its way into the site, you can filter it. Um, we can have editors like more closely monitor their hubs. Um, and that's pretty much it. There is one other thing I wanted to show real quick, which is the audit content dashboard. So it's a bit slow right now. We'll probably optimize it in the future, but basically what um, what it shows is it's kind of like the live feed, but a little bit different. So it shows every piece of content that makes its way to the site. You can see there is a little icon indicating what the content is. So you can see uploading paper, comments, etc. And it's kind of a shortcut to monitor all the content on the site. And the cool thing is that you can actually take actions in bulk. So let's say you see like uh, five different, you know, bad things. So you can like, you know, um, select five things and you can click this uh, remove icon and then you can go ahead and give a reason. And 
um, all of the content you selected will be removed. So I'm not going to do that, obviously. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, one of the things we're going to be releasing this week is a notification to the user because it is important to let people know why we remove their content. So that's going to come this week. And whenever basically content gets removed, um, the author of that content will be notified with the reason of why it was removed. Um, yep, yeah, that's pretty much it. This is awesome, Kobe. This is like really great. It will help a lot, like you know, keeping uh, the, the content on the on the platform. So right now, only uh, editors have the the access, right? Yes, access editors the... exactly. In the future, we think that if we get some power users with over a certain rep, we can give them some access to it as well. But for now, only editors. Yeah, that makes sense. That totally makes sense. Okay. I guess does anybody have any like uh, thoughts or feedback just from that like first initial kind of overview? I'm sure we'll be able to like squash a bunch of bugs that pop up over the next week or so. Yeah, my initial thoughts is that is similar to Ricardo's. It looks great. I think giving editors the the flexibility where they can decide, you know, what to remove and what not is the best initial solution to the spam at the level that it's at at the moment. And I think in terms of bugs, I'm sure we can pick up on them as, as we go along and, and post them in the chat. So, so yeah, I, I think it's great. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, it's great to hear. I guess uh, one specific question I have is for uh, like the list of things you can flag posts for. Um, sorry, I let this person in. Um, does this look like a good list to you? Is there anything you would include in here? Anything you'd change? I think we based like the initial framework of this from um, Stack Overflow because you can you can flag stuff for a bunch of reasons there as well. I I guess like having a an an other of some sort can sometimes be useful, but I guess that could come under low quality or spam and then be explained. But like it, it, there's all, often times where something won't fit into a category, but but you know you feel strongly that it shouldn't be up there. So you're thinking like other and then like a like a field that you could fill in with a character limit. Exactly. Yeah, exactly that. And then that could go to to Kobe or you know the dev team and they can then get some data on you know the the stuff that hasn't been categorized and maybe if there needs to be another category added then then go for it. Totally. Yeah, it's a great idea. Makes sense. Yeah, you could also probably group low quality and non-constructive, but I see why you're doing this. Like trying to like someone that receives a non-constructive is more like, hey, you should just use an upvote or a downvote. While low quality is, is just like a bad comment. So yeah, I see why you're using a different one. Oh, what do yeah, we do? Very fair. Yeah, I was thinking about that too. What what do we do with like that happened a couple of times? Uh and I think it, like some of us, like editors, have uh, commented. Uh, if we get a comment that is like not in English, it's another language. Is there kind of like a way to report that? Mm, good question. We should definitely add that too, because then like a, a prompt to have the person translate it rather than like just removing it because it's in a different language. I think, yeah. That's exactly. Maybe it's good content, but I cannot really judge it. I've seen a couple of probably a content in like Chinese that I wasn't able to understand. And I saw someone commenting like, hey, you should use English. Yeah, that's a great point, Ricardo. We definitely should add that. It's a good point. And I also think it makes sense to add these together too, just to reduce the number of different uh, like things we could add. Yeah, I agree. I think it makes sense. It seems to me that low quality might refer more to something like if someone were to post a conspiracy theory or something that sort of would categorize as misinformation, but not constructive is just those kind of those uh, really short comments that they're just putting in for points. Is that what the difference is? I think that's exactly what the, in, like, the initial intention was, yeah. Uh, I also think that those two can be mixed together, but in addition also the copyright infringement and plagiarism, I mean, you know, like it's, 
pretty much on the same lines. Like, we won't be able to tell, like, where every comment is coming from. But if it feels like, okay, it's taken directly from the paper or one of the references, then it would be another category. And, and that would make the job of the editors a little easier to pick from these, you know, rather than making it a big list. Yeah, it makes total sense. It actually makes sense to combine copyright infringement and plagiarism. Um, yeah, because like uh, at the end of the day, like the exact reason matters less um, in this context. I think like buckets, bigger buckets work. So I like that. I guess the, the only thing to, to think of here is like copyright infringement feels like a misdemeanor to me you know, to mm -hmm. expect everybody to understand the rules, you know, when it comes to like what you can legally share or not, like people will make mistakes there. With plagiarism, mm -hmm. it's like intentional and like a big, big no-no. And mm -hmm. so just this is like a like anecdote here. Um, we, we've been automatically suspending accounts like pretty liberally um, using our machine learning filter. And so some people had come to our Discord trying to be like um, reinstated and some of their posting history, we actually had to run it through, or um, a community member did this, but they ran it through like a plagiarism detector. And so they were copying sentences from other scientific papers to put in as like uh, analysis almost. And it was kind of hard to find. And I think it's pretty important that we like, when people do that, we have a big message that's like, hey, this is very not cool. Like you're not coming back kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good point. Cool. Yeah, yeah, one of the things I'm going to, we're probably going to do in the very near future and something will be helpful for moderators is uh, next to each person, like every time something gets flagged basically and makes its way into the dashboard, we would put like uh, some kind of like an off off offense count next to the person's like title. So you can be like maybe minus seven, meaning like, oh, this person has made seven offenses. And, and maybe it's more likely that uh, it's a visual cue to be like, oh, man, maybe let's remove this content. Um, so, yeah, or something something to help moderators. Obviously, we're small and it's not necessary, but in the future, when we get bigger, it might be helpful. Cool. So any other final thoughts on uh, flagging and the editor dashboard before we move on? Yeah, what, what do we have, like a cutoff? Like after five, you're out. <laughs> after three, you're out. Like how does it work on the other side? No, there is no count at the moment. Um, right now, it's all about removing flag content. And uh, at the moment, um, it doesn't ban or like there is no banning. So I actually don't know. Do, you, the, do editors at the moment have the ability to ban users? Is that a thing or no? No, I don't think so. I, I think, yeah, it's just it's just like the the admins and then the machine learning filter will ban people. Yeah, so I think uh, for now, I think it's okay. We'll keep an eye on it. Uh, but if you feel that someone should be banned and they're not automatically banned by our machine learning, let us know and we will definitely take action. And if needed in the future, obviously we can auto ban or something. Yeah, it's probably not needed now. I mean, it's you know, easier to probably just like take a look at the, the minus kind of score. Exactly. Um, before you delete some of those options of why a comment's being flagged, um, I'm wondering if there are reasons why maybe they should be kept um, as far as just collecting data. Um, if you guys yeah, good, good question. Might be worth keeping. Yeah, at this point, like we didn't put a a reason for keeping right now what happens is you have the ability to dismiss flag content and when you dismiss it behind the scenes it's kind of silly but it works it basically just does like a not and appends like the reason so if you flag it as spam and you dismiss it so the reason behind the scenes will be not spam uh that's why it was dismissed which can work for now as a indicator of saying like uh this was tagged as spam, but it's actually not spam. Uh, over time, we might need to introduce a different mechanism.
Okay, cool. Awesome. Yeah, thanks everybody for the feedback there. So the next thing uh, that we wanted to go over was we're redesigning our paper page. And so just for context, I'll show the old paper page and then what the new redesign looks like. And we'd love to hear what everybody thinks. And then this is all Kobe's work as well. So Kobe, if you have any like thoughts, feel free to, to take it away too. But so here's the uh, current paper page. Everybody's familiar. And then uh, here's the new redesign. Um, one of the big things we did here is uh, put a fixed width to the text. So it's a lot easier to just read everything as you scroll down. We also tried to uh, like clean up this right column a little bit and move some information directly under the uh, like actual title of the paper. Um, eventually, we plan to be able to pull out like more metadata about posts, like uh, the journal that they're in, the license that the content is shared under, uh, stuff like that. But yeah, curious what everybody thinks here. Yeah, one thing I'll add is that the top section will likely change like by 5%. You can see it's kind of like a little off in some areas, um, like the metadata that is. Um, but um, yeah, we want it fixed width and, and Joyce's screen is kind of like a low resolution. So you can't see the impact, but if you have a big monitor, it's really hard to read content on the site your head needs to literally move from side to side. And the the text font is quite small. So you have to like kind of put your head closer to the screen. So we just wanted to borrow from like best practices of like other uh, sites that focus on reading and like uh, just make things uh, nicer to read. And, um, and in addition, we also updated the homepage and like basically like uh, we try to make it so the home page each card in the home page closely mimics the top section of the paper page um so yeah maybe joyce you can zoom in a little bit here on the uh, like the right uh, uh that one is maybe yeah kind of yeah i think it's okay that one is like uh, maybe not 100 percent but it's it's there so here you can see like um uh, maybe zoom in a tiny bit joyce so yeah okay so here we um <clears throat> yeah we basically uh here in this example you can see like uh um we there is a feature post um and we may not exactly do this uh verbatim but the idea is that uh some posts we may want to give editors and us internal team members the ability to make them sticky in different hubs and home pages uh, for a period of time to get more visibility so <clears throat> that's what it looks like and um and yeah the, the amount of content that was updated here in the home page is actually quite trivial so you won't notice like a big difference um yeah that's pretty much it So does anybody have any thoughts on the the new kind of like fixed width uh, paper page that we're playing around with? I, I think it looks really good. I really like the fact that you've added um, the metadata just below the title. So it's more in line with how I think journal websites look. And so then it just looks a bit more like like a paper would look in, in those settings. I, I know you said that the top header bit is still under a few minor edits. I mean, one minor edit I'd suggest is just that maybe the, the font size of the title doesn't need to be as big with the fixed width because because if it's a you mm -hmm. know title than this one it could go over four lines which is maybe a little bit too much i don't know what other people think mm -hmm. yeah i mean i agree with yeah. what nathan said oh sorry malik go ahead no worries thank you yeah, just a minor question. Uh, what is the um, the picture of the kind of like the front page of the paper actually adding right now? Just like showing if there's a PDF up uh, uploaded or not at the moment. This is something that I was asking myself for uh, for some time. So it doesn't it doesn't even do that. Sometimes we grab like the the uh, like image of the paper without actually having the PDF. So it is kind of interesting um it's it's basically just an aesthetic thing right now um for instance like when you share a paper um like on social media 
it'll pull like the image of like the paper itself um right here but yeah i th this is kind of like a, a bow on top of things it doesn't really have like a whole lot of actual functional use mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it would be nice yeah. if it pulled a figure instead of a picture of text you know like if it showed one of the the figure one or figure two it would kind of be more attention grabbing mm -hmm. so kobe something that i think would be very cool if we could somehow leverage like our user base to take screenshots like upload screenshots mm -hmm. and then have those be populated here yeah jennifer's totally right where that's like a lot cooler than having just like the front page yeah i think so in step one what we want to do is um get the paper page to look uh nicer and make it easier to read then in step two as joyce mentioned we want to leverage um our community to help us fill in content so that that means a couple of things. So that means uh, what Joey said, which is like screenshot of a figure. And in addition to that, like um, missing content. So like based on based on the license of the paper, it is very possible that we could grab the actual body of the paper and just like uh, paste it in so that people can read it on Research Hub. And that can be cool because we can then uh, turn on our inline commenting feature and you can comment directly on the text print, which is kind of cool. At the moment, it's a bit difficult. The reason why we don't do it is because extracting content, we ran into a little bit of a wall, but at the very least, we should allow uh, the community to edit it. And if you've tried to edit our papers, you notice that it's not the uh, editing the body of the paper is not really good. There is like a text editor it doesn't even let you like bold text or anything like that. So that will be step two. Um, and yeah, hopefully that'll make a, a big difference. Cool. Um, yeah, any, any other thoughts on this uh, new paper page design? I really like the inline commenting idea Kobe mentioned will be coming in the future. Yeah, it's it's we had that shipped maybe like six months ago, and it is pretty cool. Like it works really well, and I think it would help to facilitate discussions. It's just it's hard to get scientific papers into like HTML, um, but we're working on it. Okay, cool. Um, so. Uh, the next thing on the discussion topic is uh, the last community call, we spent a lot of time talking about uh, bounties for peer review. And so we were thinking about this a little bit more. And um, we wonder if this feature could be like, kind of looked at from a more global perspective, where maybe there are lots of different bounties that people would like to create on Research Hub, not just for peer review. Um, kind of the example of this uh, that has come up a few times is Jeff uh asked for citations about like a specific uh methodology he was interested in using in his own lab so he kind of put a custom made bounty up on like anyone who could find relevant citations for him and so this like information request bounty is something like that's pretty common um like so just personal example um, my dog had osteosarcoma and so I was like thinking about like whether to do treatments or surgery or like what the options were or whatever. And there are a lot of like very recent like papers that are kind of different than what's online for blogs. And so like I spent way too much time trying to like figure it all out myself and I could have put a bounty for like a hundred bucks for someone else to who's like maybe familiar with the literature to like share citations that are like most relevant. And so yeah, there's potential for lots of different bounties, even bounties for like replicating studies um, could kind of be looked at as almost funding in like a certain light. So yeah, curious what everybody thinks about like expanding bounties for peer review to simply bounties and having like a couple of different like categories of like transactions that can occur on Research Hub. Uh, Edwin? Yeah, so I mean, I don't know what anybody thinks, but I've always thought of Research Hub as just like, in its ideal form, the entire scientific process can be done collaboratively 
and similarly like help along that entire chain can be done um so i would say anything sort of adding to that is probably a good idea and the only reason not to do it would be like you know engineering constraints or that kind of thing um but as long as you can add that kind of feature i think that's just going further towards what this is going to be yeah it's a, it's a great point and i totally agree that it, it like long term we should basically you know hopefully provide a place for like all kinds of like scientific demands to be filled and so like the use case here which is kind of exciting because it's coming from our community and mm. like a it not coordinated with our team at all but there mm. are like two or three people uh within research hub who want to write like a a crowdsourced uh meta-analysis of um, how the relationship between cannabis and depression has changed in legal states after it became legal. And so it's like kind of an interesting topic where like uh, people, you know, across the world who are like contributing to Research Hub are going to get together and write this meta-analysis. And so they have bounties set out in Research Coin to give to people who are going to help them with like um, doing the statistics to analyze like the data that they collect. And so that's like something that would make a lot of sense through our ELN if you're like writing a paper and maybe you know you need a microscopy expert to help like analyze this one sample that you have. And so then you could put out a bounty for you know someone who has like expertise in the protocol you need to come in and like become a collaborator and earn research coin for doing so. And so it, it's cool timing where like these like community members could actually use this feature. So we're thinking about um, instead of just building bounties for peer review, backing it out and having like a couple of different bounties that people can like uh, try and like put out there and earn research coin for completing. I feel like something similar to what ResearchGate has where people can just like post questions that could be even like you know technical questions like what material should I use if I want to do this this and that or like what kind of process like I had this problem with the the, the plasma oxygen like what do you recommend doing like this this kind of things I think would be even like like potentially like really interesting because like you could put up like small bounties for people to just like seek help as you you know did for for your research uh, so kind of like even you know practical uh, kind of like lab experiences that can be shared with you know a community. Yeah, I think the point is Wait. to make the bounty system as flexible as is, is, is like reasonable now, um, and not think about like specific. I mean, maybe guide, but I think there's just a lot of creativity that can happen there if you just like create the framework for it. I would say it, it is funny you say that though, Ricardo, because that to me it reminds me a lot of like Stack Overflow where like people will be having you know trouble with some code and then they'll like ask a technical question where another technical person comes in and answers it you know based on their own experience and so that's actually where kobe got the like uh i think inspiration to back things out from just peer review bounties to these more like like global like all kinds of bounties because stack overflow lets you do that so they they let you put like a you know a karma bounty on come answer my technical question and so I think that's definitely something that we could include within the, the first version of this. Uh, Nathan? Yeah, so uh, I'm absolutely down for, for expanding it. I, I think it makes a lot of sense. I, I also think that there'll be a lot of uptake from individuals. Uh, how do I put this? Uh, I feel like big investors would be really keen on using the feature of like, this is an area we're looking at. Can people who are interested in research and know the research help us with this? And that's no. what genuine, like that, that, that brings genuine value to our, to our company. So we're willing to put up a big bounty for it. I, I, I think, you know, as much as I would wish it, you know, a lot of the time, the peer review of a niche paper tends to have a niche crowd in a lot of cases but when it comes to just like analyze the papers on this from a from a subject matter expert i think that's got a much wider reach it, am i right in thinking that um is this a feature that you're going to look to integrate into the research hub website or are we using dwork or something like that 
There, yeah, this will be like just right on the website. Like you would Absolutely. be able to click like a support button, then the bounty will pop up. You know, how do you want to like interact with this? Totally. Yeah. So, yeah I just wanted to. Yeah. Sorry. I just wanted to comment on that part. Like, because right now the bounties are only available on Slack um, or on our uh, other Discord platform. So um, um, I think as soon as we get that, then there will be more people. Because I don't know if everybody on Research Hub knows about Slack and Discord as well, or vice versa. So. Yeah, totally. It's definitely way easier to discover. And, and even for new people who are just kind of like passive consumers, like it's just another value prop that'll give you reason to to sign up and maybe like get your questions answered. Uh, would there be a way to do it anonymously? Like, or, or we should just think about how you might want to be able to put an anonymous bounty and how that would work. You know, um, I can see like, you know, a hedge fund wanting to crowdsource market research or something, but not wanting people to know what kind of research they're doing, that sort of thing. So I don't know, something worth thinking about. Yeah, totally. So anonymity is something that we've like considered a lot, but it, like the need for it hasn't totally popped up yet. So probably for the V1, we won't have that, but it, it does make sense where like, yeah, someone, even just philanthropic, donations in general people like to be yeah. not just to stay off of mailing lists and stuff yeah. like that so yeah. yeah i'm thinking the way anonymity will work on research hub um you'll probably have to hold some coins in your account and it'll be like a turn on and off like if you hold x amount of coins then you can you know have access to the anonymity toggle you can turn it on and off or and there'll be other rules to it but yeah so in theory a funder or hedge fund like they just have to invest their x RSC in the anonymity feature. Yeah. Well, more incentive to hold research coin is good, right? Totally. Yeah. So. Yeah. There is uh, one other thing I wanted to add, uh, which occurred to me, I guess, like uh, not too long ago. Initially, I was thinking, like, you know, when you click the new button and you can create a upload a paper, create a post, I was thinking there's probably going to be a new option to like create a bounty. But as I was thinking about it, it might not make sense to do it this way. Because if you think about it, a bounty can be associated with anything. A bounty does not need to be standalone. Like a bounty can be associated with a post, with a question, with a paper. Um, and what how Stack Overflow does it is actually kind of nice where you have a question answer format and you can start a bounty at any point. And then they ask you, why do you want a bounty? But you don't start a bounty right from the start. You first ask you a question, then you start a bounty. And I think that can be kind of interesting here. Um, if we took the time and added like a new uh, post type of a question, so people can ask a question and then there is a bounty associated with a question that you can add, um, after the fact. Same thing with a paper. You can upload a paper and after the fact, you can start a bounty for peer review. Um, that makes sense to me, but I'm not entirely sure that actually makes sense in the grand scheme of things. I wanted to know what others uh, think about it and if that even makes sense. I like the idea of creating the context be before actually posting the bounty and then having kind of like a toggle, like add a bounty to this. So you can still post the post and then kind of like add it uh, later. So yeah, I, I prefer, what do you what do you said, Kobe? I think it totally makes sense to not have it as a standalone feature, but more like an add-on kind of thing on either of this kind of like, um, yeah, um, sort of like new um, addition to the website. And also, like, are we going to associate this with, the, like, particular hubs? Like, um, you know, like, whatever the subject matter for which the bounty is. Like, is it, like, you know, it would make sense to be, like, if I don't know if it's a dermatology or cardiology bound, like, related topic. And would, be, would it be associated with that hub, um, you know, just uh, that would allow the hubs to be, like, I don't know, have a healthy competition about uh, with each other to have bounties and um, you know, be more visible on the website. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so if we go down this route and they will, they will be associated with um, 
content within each hub. So if it's a paper, there will be a bounty associated with it. So the hub that was associated with the paper will see the bounty. And we can surface it in the feed. So um, if you have like a bunch of papers showing up in the feed and some of them have a bounty open, we can have like a little tag saying like open bounty or two open bounties. Um, yeah, and I'm thinking like it can even like bounties can arise in various contexts. And if anyone has any thoughts, like you can uh, slack me. But I was thinking like even like imagine there is a dialogue happening in the comment section and maybe one person is like, uh, oh, I want to see a summary of this or something like that. And it can even start there too. Um, it needs to start in the context. Um, but yeah, we need to figure out like how that actually works as a product. One thing that I will probably won't do is grouping all the bounties together, kind of like having like a bounty section. Uh, I think I had that uh, kind of like exchange of ideas with another uh, user on this topic. I think it makes more sense to just have it just for the hub. So within the hub, you can kind of like search for the bounties, but I don't know what kind of like added value you will bring having just a bounty kind of hub, like a hub where you find all the bounties. That will just like attract people looking for, you know, because a bounty is good if people want to co actually cooperate and give, you know, like good, actually um, like good content, provide good content and earn the bounty, but that can also be kind of like gamified. So the one way we could prevent this in making it making it not like hidden but kind of like you know uh, hub specific so you should already be interested in the in the topic to be able to be able to contribute to the bounty at least yeah and that's what i meant it's it's actually going to be uh per associated with different hubs so if you go to like the biology hub we might even add a new filter for like show me only things that have bounties or something like that um yeah, but there won't be like a bounty specific hub. This may not be in the, the V1, but something that could be cool is like when you're creating the bounty, what if I said, hey, like I, I want a peer review on this paper and only the top 1% of the neuroscience hub is eligible to receive this bounty or something like uh, basically filtering by reputation for who is actually eligible to complete it. Um, in order to kind of like make sure only certain types of users like actually got the bounty that you were putting out there. We should definitely get reputation right before doing that. For sure. Oh yeah, definitely. Reputation is not good at the moment. Yeah, I agree on the reputation. Yeah. I think it totally makes sense to do it yeah. like this. Yeah, and I think this would also bring back to what I think uh, Patrick, you had mentioned a few calls earlier as to like, you know, this will provide like grad students and stuff like an opportunity to earn a little bit like oh there is this method that i need a little bit of clarification about and they, they are doing it in and out and they can just write um you know a, 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 a small paragraph explaining the method and you know earn something that would give them i don't know like a dinner or something or whatever um so it would kind of help monetize it for them in much quicker way i keep going back to smart high school students I really think there's something there um, for simple bounty stuff. I think that could be like a group. First of all, just like getting people interested. Um, but yeah, just, I don't know. I just kind of want to put that idea out there that there, there could be stuff where like kids who are, you know, pretty bright and they're 16, 17, 18 could be a part of the community too. And there could be a lot of value there. We've done it right. Yeah, I totally agree. I have a 14 year old and I think that, you know, in the next four years, I think that would be a opp wonderful opportunity for her to kind of kind of just watch the scientific process play out in front mm -hmm. of her. And um, because in the way that it is in high school, it's, it's pretty limited, it doesn't really give you an idea of what's going to really be like. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I agree with, with uh, what Edwin said. That's a great point. Maybe during our next marketing call, we can talk about how we could kind of like get Research Hub in front of the right eyeballs there. Because even like if you're an author and you have like a, a room full of students that you're coming to explain your paper to, that's a lot more compelling than a, a room full of other scientists who might be criticizing you. Like if we like want to bring in authors. So yeah, totally. 
education is a huge part of it. Cool. Um, yeah, so I guess any other thoughts on the bounties or anything like that before we move on? So the last thing that we want to chat about today is uh, thinking about how to increase the visibility of authors on Research Hub. Um, so uh, this is like the use case that brought this up specifically. Um, one of our editors submitted a paper that they authored to Research Hub and claimed it and everything. But for whatever reason, uh, nobody commented at all. And so uh, she pinged our chat and was like, hey, like, just wanted to like help explain like when I sh like shared a paper, I expected comments and now I'm like kind of almost feeling disappointed about it. And so like one thing that I think the most compelling value proposition that Research Hub right now has right now is like the ability to actually converse with authors and like learn about their paper. So we it's freezing. Yeah, I lost him too. <laughs> still, still choppy, Patrick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's uh hopefully you'll join right back. Um Fine. Oh, there he is. You're mute. Sorry about that. My uh, internet cut out um, a little bit outside of the house at the moment. Um, but so, yeah, essentially the idea is we want to highlight authors in a better way to help like drive conversation towards papers that have already been claimed by authors. So curious if anyone has like any thoughts on how we can do that. Um, yeah, Molly? Maybe like some way of like searching papers that are either posted by authors or claimed by authors. Like on the left, we have this section about where it just shows hub and below that the leaderboard. And then maybe somewhere in that section, if we include, um, oh, these are like author specific or I don't know how, what, how to word it, but like claimed by authors as well as posted by authors. So, so just to repeat that back, you're thinking like, uh, we could trade out one of the columns on the home page, like the trending hubs, trending users, and replace that with like uh, like trending authors or trending like papers that have been claimed by authors. Why do we need to replace instead of just add? I don't understand. We could we could yeah. add. Either way, yeah. I mean, just on that section, I think there's even a little bit space or like somewhere there so that there will be a more visibility. Yeah. I personally use the discussed feature a lot. When, you know deciding what like conversations to be a part of so something with authors would just be another flavor that i definitely think i did you know experiment with so edwin you're thinking like a, a filter up at the top to like be able to filter by author yeah click. just just another one yeah yeah i think they should just go straight to the top of trending because they're not there's not that many of them right now so we should just go straight to the top and maybe get highlighted a certain color so that as soon as you open the page, you see it kind of pop out at you and it draws your attention. Um, yeah, I agree that we should be making the experience for authors as positive as possible. So yeah. you want them to get this generation of enthusiasm on their paper. And so it should just go straight to the top. I mean, those are more important than any of the other papers that we might post that we didn't author. Yeah. Yeah, but that maybe we'll go back to the discussion of maybe fake authors. So I think to enhance also the small authors, maybe a research hub could improve the digital identity management in the sense that blockchain can do this in a secure and trusted way. Yeah, I think that the identity issue is a tough one. Because even like, um, yeah, making sure people are who they say they are, the the spammers are pretty advanced. <laughs> like they they put more thought into <laughs> it. So, 
Yeah. Um, I know. I just wonder what the Nigerian people would be able to do if they put that much energy into other things. Oh, I mean, it's so easy <laughs> from a computer too. Just look <laughs> to make money. Um, yeah. So I, I guess like I know op, Opsci, op, op Scientia, um, they're working on like a decentralized ID for researchers. Um, so I know it's like pretty challenging to do that. And kind of our perspective is like, they're doing the heavy lifting and if it works well then we'll use it um, why would decentralized id for researchers why would that be different than just regular identity i don't understand like what polygon's doing with the zero knowledge proofs on on their uh, stuff it, it could be similar i think the way that these guys are thinking of it is like you tie like your orchid uh account like to like a entry on ethereum so that way there's some kind of like like perpetual like uh listing that you have private keys for to prove that you're the person associated with like this orchid id this gmail account this like research gate account stuff like that so it's like i think it's probably pretty similar but it's like the use case is tailored towards scientific research but um yeah at this stage i think it's not quite ready yet they, they, it's still the ux is not ideal um so if, the, if people start to use that then we'll definitely leverage it but until then, I think we're going to kind of rely on like the manual verification. For instance, with authors, um, we have this like author claiming dashboard and someone has to put an email. Uh, and basically, it's pretty easy to find out if the person is who they say they are. And if there's any confusion, we actually get on a call with them where you, act, you have to talk to somebody. And like, I think that takes care of a lot of the spam. It's like a lot of work, but it, it's pretty effective. Um, and so hopefully that will last us until someone else comes up with like a, a solid like DID uh, for research that, that works well. I totally agree though, Jennifer. I think they need to be stuck up high on the homepage and like have like a, a big yellow outline to draw your attention to them. And even maybe even like the comments section be like nice and like, hey, come comment, talk to the author kind of thing. Yeah, the current author badge is really tiny. Um, it's, it doesn't draw anyone's attention to it. It's just like this, you know, green text, but something with a bit more pop, I think would increase engagement with posts from authors. By the way, I hope you told that lady who posted her paper that you would be redesigning stuff specifically to make us more engaged with authors, did you? Yeah, we, we we got lucky, and she offered to hop on a call with Pat and Kobe. So we yeah. actually have to talk to Pat and Kobe, and I think doing some of the user research for like these new kind of like design features that we want to build to make it easier to surface author content. Okay, cool. And one more thing, I think this was also previously discussed, and I'm not not always good about doing it, but is everybody, at least the editors. Uh, emailing the first author when we when you post that that hey by the way we have posted your paper on research hub um i, I do it most of the times but not not always and i haven't had any authors claim it yet but i don't know if we should continue that at least to try and see if any authors come in oh that's interesting i didn't know you're doing that that's that's really cool so have you gotten any like responses back like how many emails do you think you've sent out so far I may have sent out like a couple dozen, and uh, unfortunately, since those are like blind emails, I haven't received any response yet. So, but yeah, I, I just thought maybe because you always know the email of the corresponding author from the paper, so I was just doing that um, every time that I remember, at least. Yeah. yeah, we should during the next marketing call like workshop the copy because I've done that a, a couple times. I normally get like a like I'd say a twenty-ish percent response rate or response rate, and it's it's normally because like it'll be tied to like, hey, come to this event where we want to talk about your paper or like there's a specific question, you know, that we want you to respond to or something. Um, but yeah, that's awesome. You've been doing that. Uh, it kind of brings me to my next point that I wanted to bring up in this section was Kobe had the idea of reaching out to authors uh, of like the most commented on papers on Research Hub. So it'd basically be the exact same workflow, but the email would say, hey, lots of people are talking about your paper. Like if you want to show up and like you know share your opinion or help answer questions, like here's the link. And so there was that uh, paper about sudden infant death syndrome that came out like a week and a half ago, two weeks ago. That was like pretty interesting. 
And like even like the random like politics podcast I listened to was was talking about like the actual research paper. And so um, yeah, if we had gotten the authors to to show up, and I think we still can, like I can send that email. But um, I guess overall, what I'm trying to say is, what do you all think of like once a paper has five comments or X comments, we automatically send an email to the corresponding author saying, hey, like people are talking about your paper at Research Hub, you know, stop by and say hi to everyone. Um, I, I would probably do it manually myself to, to test it and like see what copy worked and like if we could get people to show up. But yeah, what do you all think of that idea? Um, so, sorry, um, can I say, so th there's a difference, I feel like, if I'm a professor that's busy, I've got a few publications or whatever, and I get an email saying that people are talking about like some paper uh, that I published. That sounds like something you could get um, on ResearchGate or one of these websites. Or, you know, like it wouldn't be too unusual and it could be something that could be ignored. Um, so I like the idea of like, okay, there's engagement, there's something like specific that has to do with your work and that's coming across in the email that's being sent. It's not obviously just a auto-generated email because your paper is on the site, but how to make it like more specific. I don't know if this is a good idea, but something like, uh, um, you know, people have requested an AMA based on a conversation on your paper. Um, I don't know that that's the answer, but I, what I'm trying to highlight is um, like, coming up with a format where when they get these emails, they really feel like there's something special about their paper specifically. And so it's not being auto-generated. It's like something specific about their paper and they need to pay attention to. Um, very, very quickly, Edwin, could you suggest maybe just sending them the conversation, like the five comments under yeah, the paper? Yeah, potentially, yeah. Send it to them. And, and already now when they're reading comments on their paper, they're like, oh wait, I need to respond to this kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, so Edmund, I totally agree. I think that's why I actually had like a decent response rate when I was emailing authors was because it was basically the pitch was people like your paper. We want to talk about it live. Like, do you want to talk about it live with us? Mm -hmm. And then they'd say yes. And then we'd do an event. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think it makes sense to just invite everyone who has more than five comments. And like, we'd probably actually get like 10% of people to, to show up or send a grad student or something. But that's still pretty good. You know, like, well, if, if we do it the way Nathan says, or we actually show them the conversation, yeah, I think that, that'd that be pretty good. Um, you know, maybe highlight the comments that have the most, uh, the best, you know, feedback or whatever. I think that'd be pretty good. Totally. So I can definitely try to see if we, if we get any bites this week. Um, Ioana? Um, maybe the author will start to ask questions about property rights. I mean, some authors are not aware what research hub means. I don't know. Are you saying for the copyright of whether they can share their papers or not? Yeah. Usually people want something when you are asking for something. So this could be an issue. Totally. I guess like the way and that I, I agree with, with with what Edwin said to be specific. Like for example, this month maybe Research Hub is doing an EMA about blockchains or about nesting or yeah. Something like that. Yeah, totally. Um yeah, I think that I think the AMA idea is, is a good one. And we can like be like, here are the questions that are currently listed. Like if you want to do an AMA, we'll like market it in our community and get like more questions and stuff. Then there's also like I, I'm not sure how much scientists are thinking about it, but there's like SEO benefits. Like if you do a YouTube, you know, video and someone searches your name later, they can like see your presentation about your paper online and that like helps a lot professionally. So there's stuff yeah. we can do to like help people on that end. But either you are doing like a detailed presentation about what that will represent for the reputation, either we are doing like some guidelines or some, 
I don't know, social media promotion about to be more transparent. Yeah, we can we can definitely help bring eyeballs to their paper. And normally that's, I think, at the end of the day, what most people get excited about. Um, Ricardo? Are we targeting the first or the last author? The or corresponding both? author, who you know, whoever puts oh, the yeah. email. On email. It. So, yeah, that's who we'd reach out. And then like sometimes I've had people forward me to other people. Like the corresponding author will be like the lab, like the PI, and they'll be like, "Oh, you'd rather talk to this grad student who actually wrote the paper." Okay. So, yeah. Uh, Jennifer. Um. So one of the has two things. One thing was something about you saying that uh, it would automatically invite or send out an email after five comments. The only issue um, I can foresee with that is if if a paper gets sort of spammed and suddenly it's already five I agrees. Um, and, and you don't want them like getting this automated email and then only to show up to their paper seeing a bunch of these like spam comments. Um, so it might need to be a little bit more where someone gets notified that this um, paper has five plus comments before and then then pulls the trigger on the email because I can see that being a little bit um, of a problem. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was, I guess, uh, reaching out to authors through Twitter, because there's certain um, scientists that are really active on Twitter and do a really good job of um, writing Twitter threads about their research paper. And you can tell they're like really enthusiastic to answer random questions from people and engage. So these are people who just seem already open-minded to utilizing technology to get um, their word out on their papers. And so I think um, they might be more open-minded than your average professor. And so that's another platform too we can utilize. Yeah, totally. And a uh, shout out Jeff, who over the weekend, some people were talking about like like Web3 social media or something like that. And Jeff blanked a research hub discussion. And I think people kind of liked it. Like there were some people who like thanked him for doing it. So yeah, I think we should like, you know, tastefully spam authors for sure on Twitter if there's like a solid discussion you know, going on about their paper. Cool. Yeah, so we're just at about an hour now. Um, and then also, uh, just to Jennifer, that's a great point. Like, we shouldn't be tied to an absolute number because you're right, it would just be a million plus ones. And then that looks terrible if you get that in your inbox. So that's a, a super good point to bring up. I think I'll probably try and do it manually first to like, see if there's, you know, if, if people even respond positively to the cold emails. But yeah, if it works, then we'll try and like automate things to, um, you know, take the workload down. Uh, Nathan. Yeah, I, I just make a quick point. I support what Jennifer said, and I like the idea of reaching out on Twitter as well because I feel like that corresponding email. When you're the corresponding author, you get loads and loads and loads of emails from stuff that even sometimes sounds quite real about like random conferences that are happening, random journals, random. You name it, there's some yeah. scientific endeavor in like different fonts that you get. And it's just like a constant spam to the point where you just get completely desensitized to it. You're just like, this is spam. So, so it, whatever it is, it just needs to look different to that. It needs to look like a real thing that someone actually sent me rather than like some something like that, if you see what I mean. And I feel like that doesn't happen on Twitter. Like if someone was to inbox me on Twitter, I feel like someone had actually read my stuff and then sent me something else on a different platform that wouldn't have been a bot see what i mean we may also just want to cons like i don't know, think about it a little bit right because this is big getting authors on our platform um so you know maybe hey let's just like sit on it for a week see if any of us come up with a thought um that could be super useful that could be like an agenda item next week hey guys anybody thought of anything related to this kind of thing so yeah totally and Nathan, I think you're spot on. Like a Twitter DM is probably way better than an email, especially if it's like like you know customized and well thought out. Cool. Totally. Great. All right. Well, any other uh, last minute feedback of her team? Any other thoughts? Hi, Jeff. Hey, Jeff. <laughs> What's up, guys? I'm uh, still out for a couple of days, but uh, it's like midnight here. And I think my girlfriend, uh, she's awake now. She was sleeping. But... <laughs> uh <-oh. laughs> but yeah, you guys will see a lot more of me next week. Cool.
So. All right, everybody. Well, on that note, uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks, guys. Have a good one.